Good evening. Welcome to the Lompoc City Council meeting. This is Tuesday, September 18th, 2018. It is 6.30 p.m. If you have not already done so, I'd like to remind you to turn your cell phones off or on vibrate. And Madam Clerk, we have roll call, please. Council Member Vega. Here. Council Member Starbuck. Present. Council Member Mosby. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Janelle Osborne. Here. Mayor Bob Lingle. Here. If you'll please rise, remove your hats, and join us in the invocation by Pastor Bill Denton. Up the podium, please. Podium, there you go. We want to see your smiling face. My ears are not as acute as they once were. Sorry about that, Bob. No problem. Almighty God, we thank you for the abundance of blessings we share, the magnificence of your creation, this globe which unites us to one another all the way around, for the nation and state in which we dwell, and particularly at this moment for this community of Lompoc, which we love. We pray for the members of the council as they deal with the issues often trivial and mundane, but sometimes much more serious, occasionally controversial, even explosive. But we pray that the spirit of your love might dwell within us in all of the activities and deliberations of this occasion. We thank you that you are the giver of peace and assurance and guidance. This we pray th through you. Amen. Amen. Please what remain. a privilege. Council Member Mosby just reminded me that he was a student of mine at Lompoc High School far more years ago than either one of us would like to admit. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Please remain standing and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, so uh, presentations presented elsewhere on sun, uh, see, s September 16th, I presented a proclamation to, to the, electric car, uh, the electric car show on South I Street. Uh, this is a proclamation in honor of National Drive Electric Week. And tonight we're going to have uh, two presentations. The first one we'll have uh, from the Fallen Warriors Project. They're going to give us an update on what's happening with that project in Beatty Park. Yeah. Good evening, Mayor Bob Lingle, City Council members, ladies and gentlemen. I am very honored to be able to provide, to come before you and provide a, an update of the status and the status of our construction out at uh, Fallen Warriors Memorial. If you could dim the lights, yeah. Uh, this is the, uh, we were formed seven years ago on no, in November of 2011, and uh, during that ceremony where we dedicated the flagpole, a group of us discussed the significance of what we had just done and it's a little difficult to see, but at the feet, uh, there was a little pedestal with uh, some seals of all of the um, military services there. And one of the observations was, you know, this ought to be a little more impressive than a, a little pedestal. Uh, we ought to be able to do something better than this. And so we got together and said, well, why, why don't we just explore the options? Out of that, we formed the Fallen Warriors Memorial. And so this was the beginning, November of 2011. And, oh, okay, thank you. This, uh, 
This memorial will honor all of, the warrior, all of the warriors who have fallen in the line of duty, not just for a particular period of time or a conflict. Which one does for it here? Oh, this one. Okay. One of the first things we did was develop a project goal to kind of keep us on track. And we also felt it was important to be very careful about how we define the Lompoc Valley so that we could uh, do a better job of identifying people we should honor at the memorial uh, and to uh, understand what Lompoc Valley means, or at least from the perspective of this memorial. We also created a vision that would help us guide our design in particular, but also when time come to make changes, we also held it up to this vision to make sure that we were not uh, getting far astray of what we really wanted to end up with when we were complete. And I think you'll agree when we look at the, when you look at the memorial that we have created, you'll agree we've maintained, we've been pretty faithful to our vision This is a um, computer graphic based on the engineering that we developed when we first conceived of the memorial. And I show this picture to illustrate some of the things that we had to do when we were confronted with fiscal realities and some of the construction problems. Uh, we had to make some changes to this, and I'll just point out a few of them to you. But these, these seats right here were intended to be a semicircle of black absolute granite. And I got to admit, that would have been very impressive. But cost constraints uh, kind of set in, and we had to eliminate this and go to three prefabricated benches, which I think are still very, very nice. Uh, but we had, it was just too much to, to try to, to get the, uh, bit, the black absolute granite in there. We went from five pe uh, pedestals to put the fallen warriors' names on, uh, be and we now have only four. And we eliminated the, uh, the circle down here, and we moved the... Uh, veterans because the veterans wall because when it was on paper located in this location as it is it looked just fine but when we got into construction and we saw where it was what that was really going to be in reality it wasn't too fine because it blocked the view it uh, was in the way of the watering system and being made of black absolute granite, it would have been a nightmare to try to maintain. So we moved it up into this area. And this is not really representative of what we have now. It's, it's much shorter distance than what this would lead you to believe. But other than that, it's pretty close to uh, what you see. This was the location uh, prior to the start of construction. The tree here, the cypress tree, died because of blight, and the city of Lompoc Parks Department removed it. And this is the, the uh, memorial now. And uh, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to thank Charles, I mean Michael Collins, who, create, who made, took this picture with the benefit of a, a drone. So a little bit of uh, new technology is involved here. But it's, it's a beautiful picture, and uh, I think that uh, when you go up there, you'll agree it's a beautiful memorial. I, I want to... Uh, one of the things I wanted to do tonight was give the citizens of Lompoc a, a sense of 
how the program developed in, a, in, in the seven years. But we started out just saying, we need a bunch of money. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, when we were looking at the design, it was pretty clear that uh, we were going to need to earn a lot of money. So we set about that task pretty quickly. And you can see, as we went down through 11, 12, 13, 14, we were doing pretty good, but it, it soon dawned on us that we needed to really understand what the cost was going to be. So in 2013, we did a bottoms up, we did a, a, a budget review, and it was a very conservative review, but it was done by some professionals, and uh, they said if you didn't get any help at all from uh, uh, contractors, or if it cost you uh, just whatever, the, whatever you pay, then it's, it's going to be in the neighborhood of $200,000. Well, that was an eye-opener. So we got serious about earning money, and we, developed, we started working on the Red, White, and Blue Dinner Dance, which the citizens of Lompoc were really, great, uh, were really grateful for the way Lompoc turned out to support these dinners. And you can see how our income grew over the years, primarily through that, but also through donations from the citizens of Lompoc and various merchants in Lompoc, uh, service organizations. But one of the things that we really thought we would get a lot of support from was large corporations, and that just didn't happen. So this memorial is a tribute to the citizens of Lompoc and how they supported its, its development and construction. So the bottom number down there is where we stand today. And most all of our bills are paid. We got a, some outstanding ones we know that are coming that are going to be pretty significant. Plus, we have a memorandum of understanding. We got to put back about $5,000 to in an exchequer account for the future. And, uh, but we've, we're gonna have a little bit of money to try and maintain and update the memorial over time. And our fundraising events are gonna continue. We fully expect to continue to conduct the red, white, and blue dinner dances in the future. It's been a very successful event. It seems the citizens of Lompoc really enjoy it. So. We intend to try to continue on with that event. Uh, this was our action plan. Uh, the end work there is an error. Uh, we're completed. Uh, all, we got all of our permits and approvals, and we started construction. And we've completed everything except the veterans wall down here. We haven't completely fit it. And the entrance wall requires a little bit of work yet. Uh, the landscaping is essentially complete except for around the veterans wall, uh, but it's essentially complete. Uh, a particular note, our dedication ceremony will be on November the 3rd at 11 p.m. in Beatty Park. And we've got a fairly uh, robust maintenance program in planning, and we've got people dedicated to execute that plan. Uh, the many, some of the major benefactors of the memorial, first off, I just cannot thank the citizens of Lompoc enough for the, all the support we have received in building this memorial. It absolutely would not be possible without all the love and financial support that we received. And also, the Fallen Warriors Memorial Committee really worked really hard. Uh, we had... Uh, about seven, we had 17 people on the committee, and uh, they worked hard. Parks, Recreation, and Pool Foundation, of which we are a member, uh, provided a lot of top-level management support for us and a lot of good advice as we negotiated uh, some of the steps that we had to go through in order to build the memorial. MWM Architects were the people that designed the, the facility, and they did most of the, they did just about all the work pro bono. So all the drawings and all that were all done pro bono from MWM Architects. Uh, City of Council staff, 
I, I just can't thank you folks enough for your guidance and support during this process. The Margaret Waller family were a big supporters, service organizations. I was almost hesitant to put any up there, but some did a whole lot of support, but everyone, a lot of organizations are on this list. That's not exclusive. And the business Sunbelt, uh, they, a lot of businesses helped us, but Sunbelt just come through at the end when we were really desperate for some help. Uh, team members, these are our team members, and they all had, did a lot of volunteer work. Uh, they contributed an awful lot of their expertise to build this um, and deserve an awful lot of the credit for what you see today. So I'll, I'll just take you on a quick tour of the memorial, kind of give you a close up of some of the details. These are the pedestals. They're in back absolute de granite, and on the first pedestal is uh, World War I and World War II men in, of the Lompoc Valley that died. On the second pedestal is the uh, World War, uh, the Korean War and Vietnam, and the third uh, pedestal is the uh, training and uh, other operations around the globe. And this one here is for, let me see, I got it here. For global war on terrorism. The, the fourth one is for global war on terrorism. This is the entrance pet, uh, wall, and the wall, th this is, has been covered now. The, there is a black absolute granite uh, slab on that with the name Lompoc Valley Fallen Warriors Memorial uh, on it. And here will be a, the logo of the Fallen Warriors Memorial in black absolute granite. It is absolutely stunning. Uh, this is an example of the landscape, and this part here has uh, all of the seals that we had when the flagpole was first uh, dedicated. We, remember I told you that little pedestal had the seals, of the, the service seals on it? Well, now they're located on these quadrants, on that octagon. This is where the veterans wall will go and the names of veterans who purchase tiles to uh, go on the wall will be, it'll be installed. The, the wall is here, it's paid for, the, black, the plaques are all here. We're just uh, trying to get time from the technicians to be able to put it in place. And then after it is put in place, because there'll be a lot of stomping around in here, uh, when they put that in, we'll finish up the landscaping in that area. And this is uh, another view of the landscaping. And the, uh, this right here is, is another view of that. These are the benches that I was telling you about that replaced the black absolute granite that would have been in a circle around here. We just couldn't afford that. It was just too much. I show you this view because of this little tree. <laughs> During construction, I mean, we were really sympathetic to this little tree. It was dying, and the moss had, was eating it alive. Um, and so we dedicated ourselves to saving that little tree, if we could. So one of our committee members, uh, Debbie Jones and her husband Larry, went out and they put this little cement thing around it so that nobody would ever damage the roots. And we got a drip system on it, and we've been feeding it. And you know what? We got little blooms on it. So it's coming back. And you can't see it very well, but in this area here, oh, here's a little bit, you can see it. Uh, we have strips that people can purchase tiles if they wish. 
And this is a close-up of what those tiles look like. But you can purchase these from our committee. Help us pay for upgrades and, uh, to the memorial in the future. Here is, in conclusion, I'd just like to say uh, it's going to be November the 3rd at Beatty Park at 11 o'clock. And uh, we will continue after construction to maintain and upgrade the memorial. And I would just, in conclusion, like to thank everyone for helping us create this fitting memorial to recognize the brave citizens of the Lompoc Valley that gave their life in our defense. Thank you very much, Mayor Lingo, citizens of Lompoc. Are there any questions? I... Any questions for Rob? Well, we want to thank you. We see several members of your team here, and um, I mean, I've gotten goosebumps on me right now. It's just such a wonderful project for us, and uh, it's amazing what you have done so far. It's going to be even more beautiful by the, in November when we open it up. So, thank you. Thank you for everything you've done. So, okay, one more presentation. This is a proclamation. Constitution Week. All right. All right. Another year, another thing, and we have another button for you. Oh, too. wow. Okay, very good. And for the members of the council. Okay, sounds good. Do I have to share this with them? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right here. Okay, sounds good. Okay, this is a proclamation for Constitution Week. Whereas the Constitution of the United States of America, the guardian of all our liberties, embodies the principles of limited government in a republic dedicated to rule of by law. And whereas September 17th, 2018, marks the 200, 231st anniversary of the fr framing of the Constitution of the United States, of America by the Continental Convention, and whereas it is fitting and proper to accord official recognition to this magnificent document and its memorial anniversary, and to the patriotic celebration which will con commemorate it, and whereas it is a privilege and duty of all American people to commemorate the 230. 30th anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America by appropriate ceremonies and activities. Now, therefore, I, Bob Lingle, Mayor City of Lompoc, do hereby proclaim the week of September 17th through the 23rd, 2018, as Constitution Week in the City of Lompoc and urge our citizens to study the Constitution and reflect on the privilege of being an American with all of the rights and responsibilities which that privilege involves. There you go. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a, a comment. Of we course. Also, we're members of the Daughters of America. Come on up here by the microphone. Okay. And uh, this is uh, Cindy Allen, and I'm Nancy Thompson. We also have a display in the library if you're interested. And this happens every year from September 17th through the 23rd. And so hopefully next year we'll have some little booklets to give you on the Constitution. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Oh, you gave me mine. You gave me mine. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, our Employee Appreciation Day is going to be September 27th. At this time, we'll be recognizing and thanking the employees for their dedicated service to the city of Lompoc, with some of these employees having been here over 30 years with the city. So it'll be a, a very nice attendant, attending, see that right? A nice ceremony we'll have for them. Uh, we'll be meeting over at the Dewey Center and presenting some awards to the different people for the different levels they've attained. And uh, it'll be a very large potluck type of, of service we'll be doing. 
At a council request, we'll also be bringing back the ordinance concerning chickens. That'll be coming back to council on the 16th for discussion and approval. The something I just want to make sure it had a little bit of a, a title um, issue there. The closed session tonight for the city manager's performance review is actually to set the goals and objectives for the city manager with a performance review is going to be due at the beginning of the next of this next new year. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, we're also working on two emergency resolutions, one for the homeless crisis, which will allow the city to access uh, the continuum of care funds or the homeless emergency aid program, which is also known as HEAP. And the second is to seek possible relief on the cost of the riverbed cleanup. So it'll be actually two different declarations we'll be coming forward with. The next agenda will have an item on it that will be asking to cancel the, meet cancel the meeting on November 6th, as it has commonly been done in the past due to the night of the election. And last but not least, I want to ask the police chief to come up and give a just a brief update on the riverbed and the cleanup and where we are today. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Lingle, Council, uh, Pat Walsh, Police Chief. I just want to give a quick update. Thanks. So Monday, uh, we started our evictions, uh, went very smoothly. About 55 people came to the triage center. Um, uh, very surprising, we didn't anticipate that many, but uh, between our partners and the city and the county, we were able to get enough tents and, and sleeping bags, so we have a pretty large camp out there. Um, we are uh, very intensively acting, uh, working with, uh, with uh, the folks out there. Uh, county has sent mental health, uh, public health, social services. Uh, the public defender's office has sent several uh, outreach workers. And uh, today we have about 10 people that have sought uh, either drug treatment or entered the shelter system. Uh, which is really the, the key to this whole problem. Most of the folks out there are, are having drug addictions and if we can get them off of their drug, uh, maybe we can get them back to society and housed. Um, I'm not gonna uh, sugarcoat it. We still are having criminal activity. Uh, it's, it's in close proximity to the river uh, and so folks are, e are able to go back and forth uh, in the cover of darkness and so we're working on, on some of that. Uh, we've made some arrests at the triage center and uh, we've kind of coalesced. It's been very chaotic. Uh, it's very difficult to, to create something you've never done, to work with folks you really haven't worked this closely together with before. And so we all have our, we come at it at, at a different angle. But as the end of last week and, and this week, we really kind of come together and decide, okay, look, if these people the ones that are causing problems are disrupting the others that want help, then we're gonna kick them out. So we have been kicking people out of the triage center. Uh, and I think that's kind of important because it, we, we don't really want drugs in our triage center, which we are having right now, because that's gonna affect the people that are actually trying to, to get off drugs. And so uh, the patrol, we're patrolling and we're, we're doing, uh, we're patrolling the river every single day. Uh, we've made three arrests for folks that have gone back and re, uh, inhabited their their campsites uh, arrest for trespassing and the good thing about that too is the public defender is there and her and her team could can work with that person in court if they don't want to work with us at the triage center and they don't want to you know obey this this new uh, mandate then then maybe we can get them some treatment in their court system um, and you know i'm going to continue to ask for for help uh the from the public, you know, there's a lot of commentation on what we're doing, uh, which is fine, uh, but really what, what is needed is help. Um, you know, uh, Pastor Brian is here with us tonight. He has a, a mission, my commission, it's completely for this project. Uh, he's blowing through money, and so if you wanna donate to my commission or uh, Coast Valley Treatment is driving somebody to Palmdale as we speak, and we're going to have somebody. We've had people go to LA treatment centers and into the Valley treatment centers. Uh, that takes time and money. So, if people want to, Coast Valley treatment centers, uh, planting a seed. Good Samaritan is feeding not only people in the Samaritan uh, in their shelter, but they're also feeding twice a day uh, in the triage center. So, their food budget has gone up 
you know, twice. So uh, those are things we didn't budget for and really, uh, you know, that's what the community could help with. So uh, it's been great so far, uh, a little chaotic, but we're working through it. And I'm available if you have any questions. Councilman Starbuck. 55 people, did all of those come out of the river? Because rumor in town is that we've had a lot of outside guests show up down there. Uh, we have had some guests, we have. And, and that's, that's, you know, it's kind of on us because uh, uh, we, you know, assumed the river people were evicting would come to our uh, camp and, uh, and other folks did, uh, but we're helping them too. Uh, the, there have been people showing up from San Inez and some other towns and we've, we've declined them and said that's, you know, we're, we're not the homeless shelter for the whole county. We can't be, we're a small town. I mean, we're stretched as it is with 55 people. So uh, we're being very cognizant of that. Uh, a lady showed up today. Uh, she said, I'm recently homeless uh, today, homeless, and I'd like to be checked in. And, and we said, no, we, just, we can't. We just can't take that much on. Councilman Mosby. I yeah, want to congratulate you with Caltrans. I don't know how you got that going, but uh, I know they kind of stepped up on their own as well, but that was nice that that cleaned up because that was one of the real kind of starting points of the riverbed and such. Yeah, we, you know, they, we've been engaged with them for a long time and uh, they've been meaning to do that anyways. They need to prepare for this winter storms and that's a good place for them to, to use and stage from. And it was kind of hard to stage from it when it was kind of taken over, so. No, but I've heard nothing really well, a few hits there and there, but you guys are really doing a good job. It's not uh, other members of, of the county were, uh, thinking and believing that it was open for the whole county. So it's important to make sure that message gets out that it's not for everybody. Yeah, we don't have the resources. Um, Chief, we're still on schedule for closing the triage center in 30 days. Yes. So, you know, it's interesting the the, the folks that were living our river better, very vastly different type of homeless and you know some are very self-reliant they didn't need any of this they packed up and left and and they're moved elsewhere some are extremely grateful for the opportunity to have services um, and they're taking advantage of it uh, some aren't going to take advantage of it and you know if they don't do that in 30 days and and it's not for lack of us trying i mean there's 10 15 20 social workers out there every single day saying what do you need let's do it right now we the public defender will put them in the car take them in the courtroom take care of their warrants you know there's a lot of folks can't get their uh, benefits that they've earned because they have a warrant they have to take care of and it's small warrant like make those go away and so a lot of benefits have been restored but if people don't take advantage of it then we're done in 30 days okay any other questions? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Throop, do you, do you have a question for? Well, not a question, I was just gonna do a quick follow-up too. Okay, good, okay, thank you. Um, go ahead. Okay, so uh, the, the next phase of that too, of the, of the riverbed cleanup is actually the physical going in and removing all of the debris, which will be in the hundreds of tons. We had our first, well not the first, but another meeting today to discuss that. We're getting closer to what that actual cost might be and it, it is going to be very close to that half million dollar charge so we still need to have other partners help us out for a city of our size to take on something that really involves more than just the city of, of Lompoc we need to do something so uh, as we get the next we have the first cost in of a physical contractor coming in with an articulated boom crane to actually pull pieces out of the the riverbed with his group coming through. The next group we were discussing is to go in and they would actually do the cleanup of the brush and the trees and cut them up so it is an opened, cleared space so we can see what's going on in there. Right now it's very, very dense. Um, adding that into it, it'll be about $500,000 to get all of that done. So any help we can get from our county partners, our state partners, um, the emergency declaration we're going. I know it's sort of my pie in the sky dream, but if we can actually go all the way up and have FEMA do something, because it is an emergency with the rains that will be coming this winter, 
the uh, degradation that we have on that riverbank is necessary to get something done. Why, why wait for that emergency to hit where the bank collapses? Why not have them help us beforehand? That's what the reason for the emergency declaration. Um, the second quick one I had forgotten was also on the request for the November 6th. I'll also have the January 1st meeting as a potential meeting to cancel, being that it's New Year's Day. So. Okay. Chief. I just wanted to add one thing. You know, a lot of the community, uh, they want to help and they want to go down and pick up trash. And, and I think it's, it, it's too dangerous. There's a lot of needles. Um, there's a lot of caverns that they've built that are hidden that they could fall in. And uh, the hillside, you've all seen the hillside. It's, it's too treacherous. And so um, that's why we're not having a, a, a community cleanup because that would be a month long and we might have some folks get hurt. So I think we just should have professionals do it. That's the city manager and I's opinion. I think we agree. Okay. Any questions for the city manager? I do have one question. Um, give us again, you changed the name on the closed session. What is it? Oh, it's just calling it the, the city manager's performance review, but it concerns the goals and objectives for the six month review. So this is within for the city attorney. Um, goals and objectives, that should be an open session. We shouldn't be doing that in closed session. We're going to have a discussion in closed session about what the city manager's contract requires, whether it requires a discussion of goals for the city or of goals uh, as performance standards for the city manager. Goals for the city would need to be discussed in open session. We will not do that in closed session. Uh, goals as far as city manager's performance goals or performance standards are something that we will discuss in closed session. Okay, so it's not goals that we would like the city manager to accomplish for the city. That's not it. We won't discuss that in closed session. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, anything else for the city manager? Okay, public comment on the consent calendar. The consent calendar consists of items that are generally considered routine and will be passed with one motion by the council. So public comment on the consent calendar only. Seeing no one rise, we're gonna close public comment on the consent calendar, bring it back to the council. Again, the consent calendar consists of items that are generally considered routine, will be passed with one motion by the council unless a council member chooses to pull an item. Does any council member wish to pull an item? Seeing no one, I'll entertain a motion. Council Member Vega. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the consent calendar. And <coughs> Council Member Mosby. I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. That passes 5-0, thank you. Okay, no staff presentations, okay. Move on to now oral communication. This is your opportunity to speak to us for up to three minutes on any item that can come before the council. If the item is on the agenda, you may want to wait till it comes up so we have time, a chance to review it for you. Good evening, council members. John Lynn, chairman of the Parks Foundation. I want to share the truth about the motorsports park and spending of tax dollars. Ron Fink, Bob Lingle, Janelle Osborne, Robert Cuthbert, and Shirley Sherman all say that over $600,000 in tax dollars were wasted on the motorsports park and the state grant is from taxes. The truth is simple. The California legislature passed a fee that is added to the cost of the green sticker which all off-road vehicles must have. The fees go into a trust fund that can only be used to maintain or build off-road vehicle areas or for off-road law enforcement. The city only received $237,025 for work done from the state trust fund on the off-road motorcycle tracks. All of the money provided by the Motorsports Committee of the Foundation was from donations and local fundraisers, not taxes. The Foundation paid the city 
over $168,000 for the 25% match of the state grant and for work done by the city that was not covered by the grant. On November 19, 2013, the City Council voted unanimously, including Council Members Lingle and Starbuck, to apply for the state grant. In the Council motion, you will all recall, Council Member Costa specified that no city funds could be used. You will recall staff repeatedly cited that portion of the motion for why they could not do something to move the project forward more quickly. The City Council certified the environmental document in December of 2016, which completed phase one of the grant and allowed the state parks to reimburse city expenditures. In the end, the city had more grant funds from the foundation and it needed and returned $7,600 to the foundation. Phase two construction funds, which the city had to agreed to spend under the grant of over $762,000 were lost. The grant in the grant process, the city received 15% of the additional funds over the actual expenditures to cover miscellaneous costs. That 15% was about $35,000. So it was kind of free money. After the Motorsports Park was canceled in December of 2017, Mayor Lingle received a campaign donation of $1,941 between January 1st and January 30th, 2018, according to his campaign filings. And that was from the owners of Skydive Santa Barbara who opposed the park. That was seven weeks after the election, and the records show that all of the campaign bills had already been paid. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? I'm Chip Arias, the president of Lompoc Police Officers Association. Um, obviously, based on what he said, and you guys don't work real well together, so a change might be good. But um, aside from that, I've been talking with a lot of people in the community, and I'm hearing a lot of things about comments about you guys gave us a raise, and oh, that's hurting your budget. That's not hurting your budget. Because you guys gave us, for the first time, I've been here 19 years now. For the first time in 12 years, you guys gave us something more than 1% a year. And I don't stay here for money. I stay here because of my community. Um, you see the projects we're taking on. I know you guys watch the news, especially around this time of year. And you guys know, in the last three months, we've had 16 major events. More could have been catastrophic had certain officers not been trained in dealing with traumatic injuries, and that's how people got saved. Um, you guys have done nothing to address the need of police officers. You're trying to fudge numbers as far as what we need. Look at every annual report. I understand we made concessions to maybe hold on to three bodies for this budget cycle. Well, this budget cycle will be over next July. That's fine. That puts our numbers to 48, not 44, not 46, 48. I'm well aware of the numbers. I don't come up and just talk. I don't come up and not research. You have done nothing to address that. You asked, you guys gave us a healthy raise. Everybody out there, we got a healthy raise. We're appreciative. We haven't, we've lost one officer since you gave us that raise. Okay? But then you took it out from underneath us, pulled the carpet out. You asked the chief for a 5% raise. He's the only department head that gave you what you asked for. And you still burned him for another $1 and we're still under because he's responsible for is what he's doing. Look at all the things that we're doing. We need help. I don't mind working every day. I don't mind, but it's taking a toll on me. It's taking a toll on some of these other guys that work the heavy, do the heavy lifting, and it's getting a little tiresome. You know, you guys have set this tone about departments and general fund and where money goes to. I'm not going to get into that. Their job's important as well. But I know we respond to more than 1,000 calls for service a month. 1,000. When we have maybe working at one time, at most, five, five to seven officers for six, seven hours over the weekend maybe with the supervisor, where other departments are staffed full. You know, you got a building in here that's <laughs> billowing with people. You got people everywhere in City Hall. If you look at where your vacancies are, 
They're all at our department, and you've done nothing to address that. And if you're going out here and telling, oh, we support public safety, you're not really showing it. So I'd hope that something happens in the near future to fix that. Thank you. Thank you, Chip. Anyone else? Okay, seeing no one rise, we're gonna close oral communication and we're gonna go on to the council requests. Uh, it's item number four. Uh, introduction of ordinance number 1652 parentheses 18 to repeal Lompoc's Municipal Code section 1028140 rotating uh, to time limits on street and sidewalk vendors. This is our city attorney. Actually, Assistant City Attorney. Good evening, Mayor, <clears throat> members of the City Council. My name is Jeff Malavi, Assistant City Attorney. Um, I'm here tonight to talk about our sidewalk vendor, our mobile vendor ordinance, specifically about sidewalk push carts and food trucks. The Lompoc Municipal Code has a section with a 10-minute time limit on stopping for sidewalk push carts and food trucks on the street. We received a letter a few months ago from an organization called the Institute for Justice, uh, challenging that section and alleging that it was invalid under the law. The city attorney's office did an analysis of the arguments that they made and found that there were court cases that in the past had invalidated time limits, 30 minute time limits, 90 minute time limits, uh, and uh, other shorter time limits like our 10 minute time limit for mobile vending push carts and for food trucks. Uh, the courts held that there was not a rational basis for a time limit and that in fact it did not enhance public safety but was detrimental to public safety because of uh, the parking and going back into the street, stopping and starting that food trucks and push carts would need to do. So what we're recommending, um, or our plan is for the zoning code update to include uh, numerous regulations on these types of uses. They're already in the draft public version of the zoning code update. The planning commission has not made it that far yet, so they haven't been discussed at a public hearing. Uh, but we do have a set of new mobile vending regulations in the zoning code update. So what we are recommending to the council is to repeal for now the uh, section of the municipal code with the 10 minute time limit, which is section 10.28.140. Uh, and to, um, when the zoning code update rolls around, to adopt legally valid regulations at that time. I would also mention that there was a bill signed by Governor Brown just yesterday, uh, SB 946, that imposes even even more requirements on the ability of cities to regulate uh, sidewalk push carts. So we're going to have to be analyzing that bill and probably revising some of the regulations in the zoning code update due to that. It takes effect in January. <clears throat> so the staff recommendation is to waive reading and introduce the ordinance that's before you tonight that repeals the 10 minute limitation on uh, sidewalk vendors and food trucks and I'm available for any questions. Any questions? Councilmember Vega. Jeff, uh, by, by repealing this ordinance, uh, is it a free for all now until the zoning code update uh, is implemented because uh, can they actually run a food cart for 24 hours? It's not a free for all because we still have a requirement in Title 10, which I forgot to mention, thank you for reminding me, that a permit is still required by the city engineer or the traffic engineer to um, operate one of these sidewalk food carts or uh, food trucks. And under that permit, the city has the authority to determine the locations where the uh, operator can sell their wares. Uh, that's what we have in the code right now. Uh, honestly, if we kept the 10 minute limitation, it wouldn't be enforceable because it's illegal anyway. So we sure. have what we have in the code. I guess my question would be, can they operate from 11 p.m. till 8 in the morning, and, uh, or is that, that's the part I was talking about as far as a, a free-for-all also, or is that part of the permit process? 
That's not part of the permit process. Uh, the permit in the code specifically allows us to regulate location. It does not say time of day. We do have those regulations in the zoning code update, however. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I talked to you a little bit earlier about this today, and all these vendors will still require a business license. Yes. Is that correct? And um, we also talked about health permits, and you weren't sure about that, but I'm, I'm just going to make the assumption, I'm hoping that all these cards do have health permits if they're selling food products. So is there some way we can check on that? When I, I know that our code does not require them to show evidence of having a county health permit, uh, but they may need one under county regulation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, public comment. No one wants to speak to us. Okay. We'll bring it back to the council. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you've got to come up to the... Um, just what um, our attorney just mentioned, that the 10-minute um, the issue, I mean, I'm just learning of this now. It just sounded very arbitrary in the first place to stop and go, but he explained that that would um, be null and void. But also, it seems to me that the time factor might be, wouldn't that correspond to just like locations, like if you're in a commercial neighborhood, for example? And well, I'm probably, never mind, I'm just, it just seems like the time constraint sounded very arbitrary, but it sounded like it's illegal anyway, so thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to close public comment and bring it back to the council. Councilor Starbuck. Yeah. Mr. Monway, this would supersede anything else as far as the, our traffic ordinance has a, a, a section in there about mobile vending and stuff also. That would automatically be updated with the acceptance of this resolution, right? Uh, not sure the ordinance you're talking about, but uh, no, this ordinance would only repeal the 10 minute time limit restriction that's in Title 10. It wouldn't affect any other ordinance in the code. Anyone else? Okay, then I'll entertain a motion. Councilor Vega. I'll entertain a motion that we accept staff's recommendation of repealing this 10 minute uh, time limit. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Let's vote. And that passes 5 0. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item number five. Item number five is a discussion and consideration of authorizing the city manager to request a proposal from Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office and Santa Maria Police Department to provide dispatch services for the city of Lompoc. Um, I guess that's Mr. Walsh, or Chief Walsh. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, myself and uh, Chief Curris have been uh, working on this for, for quite some time. Uh, you've read the staff report. We are uh, we've been constantly hiring in dispatch. Uh, we're extremely short. Uh, we're, we're, we have two officers and a jailer working in our uh, dispatch center, and uh, you know we're we're one injury or or you know somebody getting hired somewhere else away from having to do this as an emergency. So I think it makes sense to to look at our options. And so we had come to you uh, a while back to ask about a feasibility study, and you allowed us to do that. But uh, now we're, we're, we're getting serious. We'd like to ask for RFP and get real numbers from, from both these agencies. OK, any questions? Any other? Chief, Captain, anyone say anything? So, so uh, Captain Mariani is in charge of dispatch. So if there's any deep, you know, if you want to get down in the details, he's the guy to ask. Uh, Councilor Vega. Captain Mariani, uh, are there any additional costs to this service or it's actually uh, a public safety issue? Is that correct? Is that why this is being brought to us because of a lack of being able to retain our dispatchers? Absolutely. 
and uh, we are authorized to have eight dispatchers and one dispatch supervisor. We have not had a dispatch supervisor by title, so to speak, since January of this year when the last one resigned. In that time, we've had to uh, dedicate one of our sergeants to act as the acting supervisor for uh, dispatch along with his other ancillary duties. We're supposed to have eight dispatchers, and when I first got here, I looked at the workload and the formula, and usually for a dispatch center our size, we should have probably 11 dispatchers, but we've survived for many years at, at eight dispatchers, which doesn't factor in if, uh, you know, vacation times, injuries, training issues, or training uh, requirements, so that impacts our service too. We are currently at three full-time dispatchers. And as the chief mentioned, we've had to augment dispatch with uh, two police officers who are working technically out of classification. And then we have a jailer who works anywhere from 60 to 90% of his time as a dispatcher as well. We also have a cadre of some part-time dispatchers, but they have full-time jobs. So a lot of times when we call out to them, if they're not available, that means that the the core of six dispatchers have to work uh, in excess of their required hours on, on any given week. So usually a dispatcher should work uh, <clears throat> three 12 hour shifts and um, then another week where they work uh, four 12 hour shifts or, or an eight hour shift within those, with those uh, three 12 hours. Our dispatchers are working anywhere between four to five and sometimes six 12 hour shifts during a given week. They have done a remarkable job, but they are um, very, very uh, weary. Um, and as the chief mentioned, we're just one, one dispatcher uh, calling in or getting ill or some other crisis uh, to keep us from having to go to county under emergency situation. So would our dispatch uh, area here be disbanded and with the infrastructure uh, on a countywide basis, is it already in place or is that going to be a brand new infrastructure should they decide to go to a, a countywide dispatch, you know, where everybody buys in? Or, and are there more, are all the cities buying in or is it going to just be a couple of cities into right. the county, county infrastructure? Right now, I can't speak to that. I know that there is uh, some discussion at the county and if you looked at the last county supervisors meeting where they talked about some, some form of uh, uh, a different version of dispatch systems. Uh, there's there's a been a push, um, not only nationwide, but in the state of California for some time, for many jurisdictions to consider regionalized dispatch for public safety. Uh, there's been several successful transitions to that, but it's very costly. But at one point, um, it's probably um, the best option to consider. It's costly, but uh, it, it it saves lives and it creates efficiency as well. So we're in the preliminary stages of seeing if this group can be created or this dispatch center countywide. Um, is there a model somewhere else that's already being used uh, that's, been, that's been successful as far as retention, as far as with dispatchers? In terms of regional dispatch, probably the two premier models uh, right now are Contra Costa County and I believe San Diego, but uh, our move isn't uh, necessarily the, the impetus or, or the genesis for regionalization. Our move to go to the county or to Santa Maria to consider them is to be able to provide a critical function. If down the road regionalization uh, comes to be, that's gonna be a decision for all of the policy makers to, uh, to arrive at. Cool, thank you. Councilman Mosby. Is there time limitations for this RFP? And how long is it gonna take? Well, we've gotten some preliminary numbers from the county. Uh, so I imagine that in short order, probably the city of Santa Maria can do it as well. We're hoping in 30 days or less to, to come back and say, hey, these are some options. And then uh, of course it'll be subject to the meet and confer process. Uh, and then we're gonna have to look at uh, how to best transition that if it is approved uh, by you. And the reason why I say that is because you are in a critical state and I don't know and the city attorney can help out. Is there a process? Because a lot of times RFP, RFQ process can be 30 days, 60 day, 90 day, noticing, <clears> moving <throat> it forward. But is there, is there a mechanism to move this a little faster? I 
I mean, we can say that we want our responses to the RFP or the RFQ in a faster time period in less than 30 days. That's what I come up with. Okay. I was going to say, just in general, it, it really, we, we could say we want it in two weeks, but it would depend upon the agencies and how quickly they can do their analysis and turn it around. But I think if we tell them it's an urgent matter that they hopefully work faster on it. I just hate to see us in this situation that, because I know some of the RFP, RFQ process can be three months, six months or something. So those are, you know, with, with the looks on their faces and the way that, that the key words are in here, it needs to be expedited, so. Councilor <clears throat> Starbuck. This has always been a problem and I'm glad that we're going proactive <clears throat> on it, but looking down the road, what was, is our guarantee that all of a sudden we don't, we contract with the county and then all of a sudden we're paying a 10% addition every year. Is there a way in our RFP that we can get a guarantee of uh, CPI increases or what's gonna guarantee our costs beyond the 19 budget? You know, I can't speak to that because the, the natural trend is costs always go up. If you look at any type of service, they're gonna go over up over a period of time. But I think, um, that would be something that the policy making board or, or those who decide on the contract uh, could, could uh, make those stipulations or make those conditions. But uh, we can expect an increase. I, I mean, it'd be foolish for me to say that we're not gonna have increases. Whether we stay, uh, you know, if we were able to survive on our own, we're gonna have an increase in costs as well. Understood, but I guess in the RFP, it would, I would sure like to address that if Santa Barbara County is going to an additional 2%, our share should be 2%, vice five or something, you know, across the board. Sure. Councilman Vega. Uh, oh. Council uh, Mayor, I just wanted to say, uh, this is kind of the first step to regionalization. With regionalization, there will be some initial costs, but then they will probably go down. Right now, we're probably paying over $100, $110 a call. With regionalization, and Ventura County has this with their fire and EMS, they've lowered their cost per call down to about $50, $50 per call. So the initial getting in will be, might be a little bit more. There's gonna be uh, some costs that we haven't even foreseen yet, but overall, during the long term, it, there will be some savings. You know, and there's, there's also some benefits that comes with dispatch. And um, some of them are uh, the closest resource will be responded. No longer will um, Santa Barbara County's engine have to respond all the way through the city, endangering our citizens and, and themselves to respond to a call in Megalito when we're one minute away. You know, it takes them nine minutes to get up there. We'll probably, so, um, closest resource will respond. And also, we will have the benefit of EMD, which is uh, emergency medical dispatch, which we don't have now. And that could probably reduce some of our calls too, or lower them to a lower level, a code two call per se, per se instead of a code three call. So it comes with added benefits and added safety. And this is also like, um, this has been going on for many, many years. In the, in the past two master plans, both of them, in the fire master plans, both of them have said that we should explore uh, outside dispatch sources. Okay, who asked that question? Okay, Councilmember Mosby. Did you have your light on? Yes. Just Quickly, is, is there a reason why we haven't had any preliminary numbers from Santa Maria? Is there any reason? So I've, I've talked to their chief. Uh, they, just keep in mind they have the Cadillac version up there. They have probably the most sophisticated uh, dispatch center, uh, I'd say, on the western coast. So uh, it's going to be expensive from them. Uh, we would have to go to Motorola radios, which are how much each? Yeah, very expensive. Fire, firefighters can't count that high, I don't know. <laughs> They're expensive though. 
Uh, and you know, we're going to have to go to them anyways. And okay, I'm not going to get out of here now. <laughs> but the, you know, at some point, we have 20-year-old radios that we carry. Uh, at some point, we're going to have to buy radios as well. So, but but uh, I talked to the chief today, and he says, whatever happens tonight, let me know. Councilman Vega. Chief Karras, I think I've had a conversation with you about the cost of, uh, and maybe the cost share of upgraded equipment. Uh, I believe uh, maybe you can kind of tell us where all of you are at as far as age of equipment that you're currently using and how far off are we from state-of-the-art stuff, okay, that probably would be part of this uh, commitment? Well, that, that's one of, one of the problems that we have. Our equipment is, is very old. Our dispatch consoles are very old. They, they all need updating and replacing. We're probably talking in the millions of dollars just to bring our equipment we have now up to the state of the art. And we'll be required in the future to go to 700 megahertz, which uh, will be very expensive. Santa Maria is already there. So we'll gotcha. Your phones aren't static or anything. They're not that old, are they? Just kidding here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Councilman Rosborn. The last question is, the current employees in dispatch, will they be protected and brought into and transfer into dispatch so that we aren't eliminating jobs, we're making sure they're, they're still able to potentially work for the other dispatch center since they'll be familiar with our community and be a, a benefit to the services? Well, normally when you have a transition like this or when someone gets absorbed, they're given an opportunity to, to go with that agency, but uh, that agency has the right to impose uh, its hiring requirements as well. Uh, but uh, it would be in their, in their best interest to take our folks. I mean, they're experienced, they're outstanding dispatchers, but uh, that agency would have to make that call. Okay. And then I have, uh, I guess it may be a comment, but it's a question as well. So Santa Barbara, you know, our phones work on Wi-Fi. Uh, Santa Barbara has a tower right here. Santa Maria does not have a tower in town, and there's hills between Lompoc and Santa Maria. Is that a concern? That may be a concern. They may have to put in a repeater, say off of Harris Grade or something like that in order to, to service us. Okay. Santa Barbara County right now, we're surrounded by their uh, repeaters and their frequencies. And as far as the fire department goes, we could probably go to them in the next few weeks if need be. Uh, through the county. We already have their frequencies on our equipment, and at times we had to use their dispatch because we couldn't get a hold of ours. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one of my major concerns is, you know, do we have the towers, do we have the repeaters? And I know Santa Barbara County does have them all around us, so. Hey, Mayor, I have my smart guy here. Sergeant Martin is my techie. Do you mind if he takes a shot at that? Sure. From Air Council. So we've spoken to Santa Maria a little bit, and their technology is really a computer network. And the only thing that would be required is for them to set up a microwave that would shoot across the hillside into our city, and the problem is solved. It literally is simply connecting an internet cable almost to the, to the system, and we would be connected to them. Simple for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Thank you. We'll open this up to the public for comment. Okay, everyone feel safe? You're safe. Okay, we're gonna close public comment, bring it back to the council. Uh, Councilman Vega. Um, I'd like to make a recommendation that we accept um, the request for uh, the RFP here for Santa Barbara and move forward and get our, move forward and get our estimate. Okay, Councilman Mosby. That's second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Let's vote. And that passes 5-0. Okay. Okay, the council is now going to recess to a closed session where we have one item. It is a, uh, whatever he said earlier, it's not a public performance evaluation. Um, city goals is what we're going to discuss in our closed session, and we will be back here when we just, finish up. Just, just to clarify for the record, Mr. Mayor, it is a public employee performance evaluation closed session, but it's not 
really going to be a performance evaluation. It's going to be a discussion of the standards by which the council will evaluate uh, um, Mr. Throop in his performance evaluation scheduled for January. That's what we're going to talk about. So, Okay, so we will see you in whatever time it takes us.
Okay, we are returning from closed session. And um, let's see, Mr. City Attorney, anything to report? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. The City Council met in closed session to discuss the one item on the agenda, which is public employee performance evaluation of the city manager. Uh, staff and the council had a discussion regarding that item, but no reportable action was taken. Okay, thank you. Um, written communications? Nothing. None. Oral communication, this is your last opportunity to speak to us for up to two minutes. Seeing no one rise, we're going to close our all communication and go to council requests and committee reports. We'll start with Councilmember Vega. No, nothing to report, sir. Okay, Councilmember Mosby. I attended the sub-regional SBCAG meeting this past Wednesday, representing the city of Lompoc. I um, also want to give a shout out to Joe Gonzalez for the, I believe he said is his 39th years for the Mexican Independence Day this last Sunday, well attended. Um, as well as a comment out that the vacancy report for city staff employment is available. There's been a lot of questions and missed comments about how many people are employed or not employed. Uh, contact the city clerk, I've been told. She would have a, a copy of that list so people can see what really is going on. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention again is this, we're gonna try again this next Friday, patching holes in Ryan Park. I think we're getting close to somewhere between four and five tons of material we put in there, leveling out the gopher holes. Um, and it looks like we have a, a new member coming to, onto the team. Former council member Skyler is going to uh, uh, aid and assist in the, uh, the, the gopher eradication at Ryan. So we're, we're taking this to the next level. So anybody interested, we have a number of people that uh, are showing up. So uh, reach out to myself or council member Starbuck. Councilor Starbuck. No reports. Councilman Rosborn. I attended the California Police Chief Conference with um, Chief Walsh, who managed to convince the Police Chief Association to have their conference in Lompoc. And it was a pleasure to meet all of the chiefs from across California and how much they had enjoyed their time in Lompoc and planned to return. So I appreciate him inviting me to be present as Mayor Pro Tem that night and thank him for, for exposing so many individuals to our great community. And then last week I attended the League of California uh, Cities Conference uh, representing the city as, as voter and um, did stay and attend and voted on behalf of the city and both of the amendments and resolutions passed with additional amendments and you can find those on the League of California Cities website and the city did pay for my attendance there. Okay, and I attended many meetings, but none at a city expense, so I have nothing to report. So with that, this city is adjourned to a regular city council meeting, 6.30 p.m. on October 2nd. Thank you and good night.